The first shock of a great earthquake had, just at that period, rent the whole neighborhood to its center. Traces of its course were visible on every side. Houses were knocked down, streets broken through and stopped, deep pits and trenches dug in the ground, enormous heaps of earth and clay thrown up, buildings that were undermined and shaking, propped by great beams of wood. Here, a chaos of carts, overthrown and jumbled together, lay topsy-turvy at the bottom of a steep, unnatural hill. There, confused treasures of iron, soaked and rusted in something that had accidentally become a pond. Everywhere were bridges that led nowhere, thoroughfares that were wholly impassable, Babel towers of chimneys wanting half their height, temporary wooden houses and enclosures in the most unlikely situations, carcasses of ragged tenements and fragments of unfinished walls and arches and piles of scaffolding and a wilderness of bricks and giant forms of cranes and tripods straddling above nothing. There were a hundred thousand shapes and substances of incompleteness, wildly mingled out of their places, upside down, burrowing in the earth, aspiring in the air, mouldering in the water, and unintelligible as any dream. Hot springs and fiery eruptions, the usual attendance upon earthquakes, lent their contributions of confusion to the scene. Boiling water hissed and heaved within the dilapidated walls, whence also the glare and the roar of flames came issuing forth. And mounds of ashes blocked up rights of way and wholly changed the law and custom of that neighborhood. In short, the yet unfinished and unopened railroad was in progress. And from the very core of all this dire disorder, trailed smoothly away upon its mighty course of civilization and improvement. But as yet, the neighborhood was shy to own the railroad. One or two bold speculators had projected streets, and one had built a little, but had stopped among the mud and ashes to consider farther of it. A brand new tavern, redolent of fresh mortar and size and fronting nothing at all, had taken for its sign the Railway Arms. But that might be a rash enterprise, and then it hoped to sell drink to the workmen. So the excavator's house of call had sprung up from a beer shop, and the old established ham and beef shop had become the Railway Eating House with a roast leg of pork daily, through interested motives of a similar immediate and popular description. Lodging house keepers were favorable in like manner, and for the like reasons were not to be trusted. The general belief was very slow. There were frowsy fields and cow houses and dung hills and dust heaps, and ditches, and gardens, and summer houses, and carpet-beating grounds at the very door of the railway. Little tumuli of oyster shells in the oyster season, and of lobster shells in the lobster season, and of broken crockery and faded cabbage leaves in all seasons, encroached upon its high places. Posts and rails and old cautions to trespassers, and backs of mean houses, and patches of wretched vegetation stared it out of countenance. Nothing was the better for it, or thought of being so. If the miserable waste ground lying near it could have laughed, it would have laughed it to scorn, like many of the miserable neighbors. <laughs> Thank you.